Hello, I'm, uh, I'm Mark Benson. I'm here from the United States. Uh, eu falo pouco português, mas meu português é merda. Uh, <laughs> I will proceed in English. Um, so, I want to start with the game, actually. You know, we've all been sitting in this hot room. It smells like shit. So, everybody stand up. Stand up. And partner up and grab each other's hands like you're shaking hands. Now, hold, hold on to the other guy's hand and stick out your, your finger like this. Okay? No, 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 no. Yeah, like that. So, the hands that you're holding, like, do this. Okay, so we're going to play a game. Every time you touch your finger to the other guy's shoulder, you get one point. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Don't hurt each other. Don't hurt each other, all right? We're going to see who can, who can get the most points. Go. to get my 
first girlfriend in college. And to me, the world was perfect. This is the girl I love. This is the girl I'm going to marry. We're going to be together forever. Everything's going to be amazing. And of course, she went and fucked some asshole. And this really fucked me up. Like, I was really, obviously, I was really upset about it. Uh, I was very confused. Everything I thought I knew about women, thought I knew about sex and love, all of a sudden, I realized that I was wrong. Or at least I didn't know what I was doing. So it was around this time that I found the game by Neil Strauss. And I got involved in the whole pickup thing. And I did the whole thing. I did the, you know, put on like the boa. And I learned the magic tricks and uh, memorized like girlfriends, jealous girlfriend stories. And I started going out and approaching. And um, it was a complete disaster. It was just, it was terrible. And, but I was very fortunate and then I got an important lesson early on. And this lesson had to do with performance, and it had to do with needs. And it happened one night, I was in a bar, I was talking to three cute girls. I was trying to do a magic, I was terrible at magic, I was horrible at it. And I was trying to do a magic trick with a coin. And it was one of these tricks where like, you make a coin disappear or something. And uh, I kept dropping the coin, and I felt like an idiot. And I, did, I dropped it like two or three times in a row, and the girls were like, ah. <laughs> and then finally, they start, I can tell, they, they start to walk off. And I was like, come on, let's go, you know, get this guy. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 I got a question, who lies more, men or women? <laughs> and they just rolled their eyes, and one of the girls looked at me, and she said, you know, you're kind of cute, you should be normal next time. <laughs>
But sure enough, I went back to the United States and I started talking to American girls. I said, you know, this part is kind of lame. Like, we should go somewhere by ourselves, make out for a while. Okay. Wow, really? Okay. <laughs> Why is this working? And at this point, I've been coaching for a few years. And I've been noticing a lot of the same problems in a lot of my clients and a lot of the guys I was working with. And basically, it was that you could teach them success, but it was only for a temporary amount of time. So you could teach a guy to be successful for the first 10 minutes, for the first hour. You could even teach him to be successful for a same night lay or a day two. But eventually, that old self, that old needy, needy self of yours comes back and things get messed up. How many people here have experienced that? You go out, you do your thing, you're killing it, and then all of a sudden you're on your second date and you're like, wow, I'm a loser again. <laughs>
left school. We don't talk about these things. We pretend they didn't happen. We avoid them. And these are all, and look, we all do this. It's impossible not to. But the thing is, is when we get in front of attractive women we like, we do them extra. Because we're trying to create this, this image of ourselves that they're attracted to. So, so why does not performance work? We already said that, one, it's unsustainable. It lasts for an hour, a day, a week, maybe a month. But two, People aren't stupid. People can read your intentions. People can look at you and say, well, he says he doesn't, he's acting like he doesn't like me, but he keeps coming back and talking to me. They can look at the subcommunication of your behavior. They look at the motivation behind your behavior. Yeah, he says he doesn't like me, but I'm the only girl he's talking to. Why is that? The reasons of your actions are far more important than your actual actions. And we all pick up on this. Everybody here has had, everybody here has experienced a time where somebody is trying to impress you, or trying to make you think that they're cool. And it's really annoying. You're like, get away from me. <laughs> Stop talking to me. Relax. It's unattractive. But the biggest reason that performance doesn't work is it implies that you're inferior. Because if you were as high value as she was, you wouldn't have to perform to make her attractive to you. And this is, you see this, I see this all the time in the industry, you know, guys say, well, she's a hot girl, she gets hit on by guys every day. Yeah, those guys suck, I'm cooler than those guys, so I don't have to pretend like I don't like her. Those other guys are performing, 99% of men out there are performing every day, even with their wives, their girlfriends, people in their families, they're performing all the time. Because they feel inferior. They feel like they have to win over the affection of people around them. They feel like they have to win over sex of women that they meet. But if you just show up and you see yourself already on the same level, she's going to see you on the same level too. Because she never meets guys who feel that way. Now, why do we, I hope nobody here is getting insulted, because we all grow up feeling like this. We all grow up feeling like we're not worth, we have to win over the sex of different women. Why is this? Well, for one, culture fucks us. What is every movie you've ever seen? Every movie you've ever seen is, Knight in Shining Armor, or Luke Skywalker, or Arnold Schwarzenegger has to blow up tons of shit, kill a bunch of people, save the world, and what is his reward? Get the girl. A hot girl. Mm -hmm. We are constantly told our entire lives that you have to save the fucking world to get a vagina. <laughs> <laughs> But it fucks women, too, because women are told their entire lives, a man is going to save the world from my vagina. I can't wait for my Prince Charming to come save the world from my vagina. And so what happens? Men walk around saying, damn, I have to do something to impress her. And women stand around saying, shit, when is a guy going to impress me? We're just, 
We're missing each other completely. The other reason that a lot of us feel this is that we just have bad prior experiences. How many people here have got screwed over by an ex-girlfriend, ex-wife, Right. Um, how many people here were pretty much rejected like their entire teenage years? Right. It's like the entire room. That's why we end up here. And I noticed this when, with guys I started coaching. It was the same story over and over again. It was all of my clients were either 22-year-old virgin or 32-year-old guy who got fucked over by his ex-wife. It was always those two guys. There's no in between. This is what attracts us here. This is why we're in this room. This is why I'm in this room. Because I felt this way too. I felt like I had to prove something. You don't have to prove anything. Not to girls, not to people in this room, not to some jackass on a forum. You're fine the way you are. The goal here is happiness. It's not lay counts. It's not lay reports. It's not getting a HB 8.76. It's just being happy. It's being comfortable with yourself. It's having awesome relationships with awesome women who make you happy, who don't give you a headache, who don't call you 40 times a fucking day saying, I thought you liked me. Because that's where performance gets you. The only girls who respond to performance are girls who perform. There are a lot of, I see a lot of guys in the industry, or in the community rather, who are always complaining. Women are so dramatic, they're so emotional, they're so manipulative. Yeah, because you're fucking manipulating them. It's the only girls that it works on. Girls who are not emotional or dramatic or manipulative say, fuck this guy. He's trying to impress me.
you guys everybody here feels anxiety right everybody here is struggling with anxiety in some situation at the moment maybe some of you guys can approach maybe some of you guys can escalate but everybody in here right now is struggling with some sort of anxiety or not now the anxiety comes from this feeling of inferiority it comes from this this feeling like you're not good enough because this is it's just classic psychology when you don't feel good enough you get nervous you get a fight or flight response and so that's where the anxiety comes from I personally suffered massively from approach anxiety and meeting new people and it took me a long time to realize that when I was a kid, uh, actually when I was about 13, uh, I got in a lot of trouble at school. I got kicked out of school, and all of my old friends at school stopped. They weren't allowed to talk to me or hang out with me. I then went to a new school with a bunch of uptight rich kids who were total assholes. And so I spent about two and a half years of my life with no friends, and everybody I tried to make friends with at my new school rejected me. And so, I grew up, without even knowing it, this feeling like people who don't already know me don't like me and they don't want to meet me. It created a lot of social anxiety in myself. I was scared to death. It didn't matter if it was a guy, girl, ugly, attractive, old, young. I was terrified. Terrified of meeting him. I used to get hammered. I used to drink so much just to talk to somebody. That's my story. Everybody here has their own story. Some people have a lot of anxiety around sex. You know, maybe they grew up in a very religious home. Um, you know, maybe something fucked up happened to their sister. You know, whatever. We all have painful things in our past that cause the anxiety in us. It's what causes us to see ourselves as below the other people. So, what do we do when we're anxious? Other than drink a lot. <laughs> What's that? It's a coffee because of drinking, of course. When we get anxious, when we get scared, we we have ways to cope with it. We have defense mechanisms. This may not be a direct translation. 
translation. I'll put uh, another word for it. Rationalization or intellectualization. We all are familiar with this one, I'm sure, too. I mean, one could kind of argue that all that fucking pickup theory. I mean, have you ever, like, have you ever looked at, I mean, I don't know about you guys, I used to read a lot of products and download seminars. Have you ever looked like, like, wow, what do I need 2,000 pages and 40 hours of seminar? It's just a fucking girl. Is it really that complicated? Thing is, it's it's not. But as long as we're intellectualizing and analyzing, we feel like we're accomplish, accomplishing something. But we're actually not. How many of you guys, and by the way, I'm totally guilty, I was guilty of this for years, so don't, don't be ashamed. How many of you guys go out together like, go out with your wingmen, and then you just stand in a little circle and talk about game. Like, <coughs> two hours. Just, like, analyze, like, thank you for being honest. <laughs> we all do it. We all do it. It's like, it's funny, actually, uh, in New York, actually, uh, uh, a girl came to, to one of my talks. And I was talking to her afterwards, and um, she she told me she's like she's like it's funny. I always thought that because like a bunch of guys raise their questions and ask questions, and they're like, yeah, I can't approach, or I can't escalate, or I can't get a date. And um, she came up to me afterwards. She's like, that's funny because I thought pickup artists were like getting laid all the time. And I'm like, no, if you went out with pickup artists, <coughs> they all stand in the corner. Your drink, talking about game, talking about theory, talking about analyzing every set. Here's a good one. Another defense mechanism. Blame, anger, culpa y hype. We try to blame somebody else for it. We blame the venue. Oh, this venue sucks. We blame the girls. Say, so, yeah, all the girls that come to clubs are, are bitches. It's obviously their fault that they don't like me. <laughs> this can go, this can get pretty deep. And over the years, I've run into a lot of, I mean, you can. The thing about blame and anger is if you do it long enough, you create beliefs. And these beliefs can be pretty fucked up. They can be very sexist. They can be racist. Um, they can just be... They can just make you an asshole. But it's a form of protecting yourself. And then finally... that we don't care about something when we actually really care. This one happens a lot. This one used to happen to me. Um, again, back when I started and I had a lot of a lot of approach anxiety. I used to go out to bars and it was funny, I'd spend the entire week reading game, studying theory, posting on forums, and then Friday night would come, and I'd go out to the bar, and I'd stand there and be like, yeah, I don't really care, I don't really want to approach. And then I'd go, and then like on Monday, I'd be like, why the fuck didn't I approach? I'd be so angry at myself. But in the moment, I convinced myself, oh, I don't care. Another popular one with this is, uh, 
is are the guys who convince themselves that none of the women are attractive. You know, they they sit on, on online and, and you know jerk off three times a day, and then you put them in a bar in front of hot girls, and they're like, yeah, they're not hot. <laughs> sure, buddy. Sure. I coached um, I coached a 25 year old virgin once, and the first night we went out, he told me that none of the girls were hot enough for him, and I'm like. Buddy, you do not get to choose. <laughs> In English, we have a saying: it's, it's uh, beggars are not cannot be choosers. Uh, yeah. So everybody can see themselves in these, right? It's not pleasant, but we all do it. So how do we overcome our anxiety? This is usually when the guys are like, oh, come on, bullshit. We overcome our anxiety when we stop feeling inferior through vulnerability. It's completely counterintuitive or paradoxical. It sounds like this would make it worse, it actually makes it better. Because think about it. It all comes back to the subcommunication. If if you're hiding everything that you think is bad about you, if you're trying to make yourself sound better, what does that tell her unconsciously? It tells her that you don't feel good enough. But if you're just open about your problems and your faults or things that are unattractive about you, what does that tell her? It tells her that you are a normal guy. Right. It tells her that you're comfortable with your faults, that you're comfortable with yourself. It tells her that you're not trying to impress her. Everybody. It's always going on about, you have to be high value, you have to demonstrate value. The way you demonstrate value is not demonstrating value. A rich guy doesn't have to go around saying, I'm rich. Hey, everybody, look, I'm rich. <laughs> Nobody does that. Oops, sorry. Uh, yep. Do you think that when you show your faults, your uh, DHVs will be much better? Because it's, it's not like you said, it's new, you're not trying to impress her. Just get from this point, <coughs> make your life See, I... I it's not like see, maybe I'm wrong. You're looking at it in terms of, like, surface conversation. So yeah, if you talk about something that maybe is unattractive about you, and then you talk about something that's attractive about you, yeah, it can make it look better. But what I'm talking about is the motivation behind it. So, if you go from being very honest and open about yourself, and then suddenly you try to impress her, then it's going to make you look bad, always. Uh, this is a question I always ask guys, is what's the difference between DHV and bragging? You know bragging? Yeah. Uh, what's the difference? <laughs> right. <laughs> and what is it about people who brag? People who brag are annoying because they want you to think that they're cooler than they are. It's like the example I always give about DHPs is um, I had a good friend years ago, back when I was doing the pickup stuff and I was trying to DHB all the time, um, and he was in a he was a lead singer in a rock band. Guy had tattoos all over him. He toured all around the United States. And um, we used to meet girls. And he would talk to them for like an hour before telling them that he was in a rock band. And I remember trying, and he got laid a lot more than I did. But of course, I tried to explain to him that he should be DHV all the time. And um, he was like, no, that's weird. He's like, he's like, a, a, that just comes across as try hard. And 
what he used to do is he would talk to the girl for about 30 minutes and then he would ask her where she's from and she would say like oh I'm from Philadelphia and he would say oh I really like Philadelphia I was there a year ago and she'd say oh why were you there, there a year ago and he's like oh my band played there so what part of Philadelphia are you from and it's he's not hiding anything he's not pushing it in her face he's just comfortable with who he is he's interested in who she is uh, where was I? Vulnerability. Um, right, so if you're not trying to prove yourself, what you're subcommunicating to her is that you're already good enough for her. You're not a guy who's intimidated by her. This is the other difference with hot girls. You know, in, in pickup theory, they say, oh, hot girls get hit on all the time, so you have to do all this stuff to impress them. The thing is, is hot girls intimidate every guy that they ever meet. If you're the one guy that she doesn't intimidate, then you're already more attractive than every other. You don't even have to say anything. You don't even have to be like, I'm in a rock band. <laughs> Just like, hi, my name's Mark. Where are you from? Oh, you're a model. That's cool. Yeah. The important thing about all of this is that, and this is the whole point I make in my book, is that any behavior can be attractive or unattractive. So any opener you have, any DHB you have, anything you say, anything you do, um, it can be attractive or unattractive. What, what determines whether it's attractive or not is the situation and your, the intention behind it. So I can say the most attractive thing in the world, but if I'm trying really hard to impress her, I'm going to be unattractive. And I can say the most unattractive thing in the world, which I have some examples here in a minute, uh, but if my motivation is genuine and I'm just trying to share myself with her um, without making an impression, uh, then it becomes attractive. So, um, so the benefits of sharing yourself openly. Well, let, actually, let's start here. There are three types of vulnerability. It's behavioral vulnerability. For instance, approaching is a, be a vulnerable behavior. Anytime you approach a girl, you're setting yourself up to be rejected. You're making your intentions clear. There's verbal vulnerability, which is when you share your ideas or thoughts. Anytime you share something that's part of yourself, you're setting yourself up you're opening yourself up to, to be rejected or for somebody to disagree with you. And then there's emotional vulnerability, which is when you openly express your feelings or your desires. So, obviously, you're really hot, I want to have sex with you, is a very vulnerable statement. Men tend to think that vulnerability is a sign of weakness, but it's actually the greatest strike, sign of strength. Vulnerability plus responsibility equals strength. Vulnerability without responsibility. So I'll give you an example. Um, like I said, when I was a teenager, I was picked on a lot, and I didn't have any friends. Now, if I'm talking to a hot girl I just met, and I'm telling her about this, so yeah, in, when I was a teenager, I was a dork, and nobody liked me, and, yeah, yeah. Um, and I say, yeah, and the world sucks, and it's their fault that I wasn't confident, and 
high school girls are bitches, then it just makes me look like an angry butthurt guy. It's very unattractive. But if I say, yeah, I got picked on when I was a teenager, and I didn't have any friends, and that taught me to be independent, and to take care of myself, and being rejected, even though it hurt, being rejected is, in the long term, one of the best things that happened to me, it makes me look very attractive. Um, I had a client a couple of years ago who, he, uh, he was a recovered alcoholic, and he called me on the phone and he said, Mark, I've got this problem, I'm doing well with women, but I, I start to go on dates with them, and they start asking me about my past, and I was an alcoholic for six or seven years, I was a total fuck up, I was drunk all the time, I had no job, I had no money, um, I don't know what to say to them. Like, I try to make jokes about it, I try to avoid the subject, but it just, it always gets awkward, and when I do tell them, like, it's very unattractive. And so I told them, I said, you know, if you're going to date these women, if you're going to have a woman who makes you happy, and that you feel comfortable around, she needs to accept this part of you. And so, you might as well tell her early, instead of late. And so he said, okay, so what should I say? And I said, you should take responsibility for it. You should say, I was an alcoholic, but I have not had a drink in six years. It was, it taught me a lot about myself. Uh, it showed me how much my family loves me, and I promised myself I'll never make that mistake again. And he said, okay, I'll go try that. And this is right around the time I was experimenting with a lot of the just being completely open and honest about my intentions. Well, he came back to me a few months later, and he said, he sent me an email, and he said, he said, uh, hey Mark, I've been doing what you said, um, and it's been incredible. So not only are they okay with it, but they appreciate that I'm telling them. It makes them trust me more. And actually, it's creating some of the best conversations I've ever had on dates in my life. Because they start telling me things about themselves. He said, I had no idea how many people struggled with stuff like this. How many people had like dark things in their past. And that's the fucked up thing, is that we all have painful things in our past, and we all have really deep insecurities, but we're all afraid to go around and talk about them. Because we all think everybody else is perfect and everybody else is okay. But if we're the first ones who are willing to open up and just talk about it, it makes other people feel comfortable talking about it. And that's a greater value that you can give somebody than the, the best line, the best joke, the best orgasm. It means so much more than that. So, I'll give you a more normal example, more pickup example. Uh, when I really started to notice that I was kind of onto something with this, uh, was I was out one night and I was at a restaurant and there was a girl sitting at the bar with a book open and she was really cute and um, so of course I did the same thing that we all do in that situation, which is I ordered another drink and sat there for 15 minutes and tried to think of a cool pickup line. And um, finally I came up with a, a clever joke and I decided to go walk over to her and say it to her. And I don't remember what the joke is. Um, all you need to know is that it was really horrible. It was not funny. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. It, it's something to do with like a nerd at a bar, and anyway. So I go over and I say it to her, and she kind of gives me this look like, God. And, uh, you know, of course I'm starting to freak out. I'm like, oh God, I just get blown out hard. And um, before she could say anything, I just come out and I say, look, that joke was really stupid. Can I try again? She was like, please try again. I was like, <laughs> so I'm like, hi, my name's Mark. I thought you were really cute. 
She's like, that's much better. And uh, so I ended up talking to her and getting her number. And um, part of our conversation was actually about how, how many guys come up and say awkward things to her, <laughs> or women in general. And she told me, she's like, you know, if more guys just came up and introduced themselves and asked if they could sit down, I would be okay with it. I wouldn't, it wouldn't put pressure on me to constantly like find a way to reject them all the time. So, the other bit, the final benefit and the most important important benefit of vulnerability is that you, you get rid of that reinforcement that you have to perform. As soon as you start removing that belief that you have to perform, and suddenly you start reinforcing the idea that you're already as good as anybody you meet or anybody you talk to. And ultimately that's going to be the most attractive thing about you. Now there are two mistakes. Uh, you know, I write a lot about vulnerability in my book, I give a lot of talks about it. There are two mistakes, you know, a lot of guys are like, awesome, that sounds great, I'm just going to go start saying and expressing whatever I want, whatever I feel. Uh, there are a few mistakes that guys run into. guys make is that they think that vulnerability is another technique. So they think, oh, I don't need to learn lines anymore, I just need to go out and say all this personal stuff and the girls will like me. And it comes back to they're still trying to perform. Sometimes I get emails from guys and they, and they say, um, hey Mark, I tried vulnerability, it doesn't work. Um, I went on a date with this girl and I told her all about how my dog died and how sad it made me and she still didn't fuck me. I'm like, dude, that's not the point. <laughs> it's not a technique. It's, and the way you know, is what's your intention? Your intention has to be unconditional. So whatever you say or do has to be done with, with no expectation in return. So many men, and this is pickup guys and non-pickup guys, so many men have this expectation that women for some reason owe them something. Say, oh, I took her out to a nice, a nice show and we, we had a nice dinner and the bitch didn't even call me back. Well, she doesn't owe you anything. This is not a transaction. Sex is not a transaction. One of my favorite lines actually came from a female friend of mine. Uh, she said that sex is, a, sex is a team sport. Sex is a collaboration. It's not, seduction is not a one person game. It's not about one person pushing their finger against the other person. It's about getting both your needs met. And that happens through collaborating. And the minute you start making your actions conditional, as soon as you start thinking, well, I'm going to tell her that she looks pretty tonight, but she better give me a compliment too. Or I'm going to uh, do this nice thing for her but she better do something nice for me too, or um, 
damn, I, I, I tried to nag her and she just got mad and left. Whenever, you're do, whenever your behaviors are motivated by an if-then, for all you computer nerds, um, it's not vulnerability, it's performance. So mistake number two, something I call emotional vomit. A lot of men, um, you know, they read the book, they get the idea, they're like, sweet, vulnerability, I'm going to go out, express myself, I don't care what she thinks. You know, I just want to attract women who like me for me. And so they go out and next thing you know, they've spent like 45 minutes going on and on and on about how much they hate their mother or, or something like that. And the girl is just terrified. Um, the other form that this takes is that a lot of guys are like, oh, cool, I can just express my emotions. Um, so I'm going to write a 10-page love letter to this girl I haven't even kissed yet. Obviously, that doesn't end well. And so this is the other email I did. So I said, Mark, I read your book. Vulnerability is awesome. It's made a big difference in my friendships. And so I decided to tell this girl how I felt, and I wrote her a 10-page love letter, and she never talked to me again. And it's like, well, how long have you been dating her? Oh, we don't date. <laughs> how long have you known her? Well, we don't really know each other. The problem with emotional vomit, and emotional vomit happens, happens to us, it's part of the process, is that emotional vomit happens when there's some sort of underlying issue. And so it's necessary to identify the issue and get over it. To give you an example from my life, uh, there was a girl that I was seen, uh, seen for a while, and she and I had really, I mean, this is back in my player days when I was fucking a lot of girls, but there was this one girl that just really, like, had a very intense chemistry, and uh, I felt very strongly about, she was actually the first one that I felt very, very strongly about after getting into the pickup, and one night we were staying up, we were staying up late, and um, we were talking until like 3, 4 in the morning. And uh, I started talking about my ex-girlfriend, the one who cheated on me and left me. And before I knew it, I had been going on for like an hour and a half about how much of a raging whore she was and how she like ruined my life. And this girl just looked at me and she's like, maybe you didn't need to tell me that. <laughs> and um, it actually, it made it awkward. And I didn't, I stopped seeing that girl. And actually it was a little bit awkward um, the few times I ran into her after that. And so it would be easy for me to say, oh, vulnerability doesn't work. But the pain of that experience caused me to realize, wow, I'm really angry about my ex-girlfriend. I buried that. I didn't realize that. I'm angry about my ex-girlfriend and it's making me angry about other girls too. That's something I need to deal with. That's something I need to get over. And it allowed me to start thinking about it and evaluating it. Uh, I actually got an email from, uh, from a guy in Germany just a few days ago who had one of these experiences. He didn't want to be, uh, you know, write a 10 page love letter things. And he said that it was, you know, he basically wrote this huge love letter and the girl was like, hey. <laughs> And um, he was crushed for about a week. But, and he said he was very angry about it. But then he said, at, as, after about a week, he started thinking about the situation. And he was like, you know, it's completely ridiculous that I felt that strongly about her so soon. Why do I feel so strongly about women like this so quickly? And he started to look at his own emotions and what was motivating him. And he sent me an email. He said it was a horrible experience. But he said, I know a lot more about myself now. He said, when I'm in a situation like that again, I'll know how to, I'll be better at handling it. I'll be better at knowing what to expect from myself. And this is ultimately, I mean, this is the long-term fix. This is the long-term stuff. This is 
is how you close that gap. You get rid of that anxiety. Is you deal with this shit. You deal with the emotional stuff. The lines are nice. They help sometimes. They make for cool stories. But ultimately, as long as you're performing, you're not dealing with the real problem. So, is there another mistake? I don't think so. <laughs> Forgetting my own content. Um, all right, so. Finish up with how to practice vulnerability. And then we'll do some QA. So, step one. Accept your anxiety. Accept that you have an issue around whatever makes you anxious. Because you can't fix what you don't acknowledge. If you pretend something doesn't exist and you try to cover it up, you never fix it. So, step one, look at whatever makes you anxious, whether it's approaching dates, getting intimate, conversations. And ask yourself, why am I, why does this freak me out? Why does this make me so nervous? There's a lot of people in pickup talk about skill a lot. And I really, my belief is that very little of this actually has to do with skill. I used to coach guys and um, they would just have horrible, horrible set after a horrible set. And they'd come back to me and they'd say, yeah, I just... I don't know how to have a funny conversation, I don't know how to uh, talk to people, like I need to work on my skills. And I would always tell them, I'd say, you know, before we came out tonight, you and I spent three hours together, had a great conversation, you told me interesting stories about yourself, you made me laugh. The problem isn't your skills, the problem is you stand in front of a hot girl brain goes to shit. So accept what your problem is. Your problem is the fear. That also means acknowledging all your defense mechanisms. All the ways that you avoid it, all the ways that you rationalize it, all the, the blame or the anger that goes along with it. Come to terms with it. Accept it. The biggest thing for me in terms of getting over my approach anxiety, and I'm still not over it, I still get nervous, but it doesn't stop me anymore. The biggest thing that helped me was I accepted that I had an approach anxiety. Because I spent years saying, when am I going to get over this? When am I going to beat this? When am I going to stop being nervous? And as long as I thought that, as long as I thought about that, it just made the anxiety stronger. And then one day, I figured, you know what? Fuck it. I'm just going to have this forever. That's just how I am. And strangely, it was okay. It's like, oh, I'm really nervous, but that's okay. That sounds a little weird, but when you experience it, you'll know. So second step. Despite the anxiety. Like I said, once you accept it, it becomes a lot easier to act in spite of it. Because you're not dedicating all this thought to, to <coughs> I have to stop being nervous, I have to stop being this. And look, there's a lot of stuff out there that says you can get rid of your approach anxiety, you can get rid of your sexual anxiety, you can be fearless and all this stuff. It's bullshit. Fear is a natural human response. Anxiety is a natural human response. The only difference, that the only thing that changes is how you react to it. You can react poorly to it and freak out, or you can react really well and use the anxiety to 
push you further, push you to act the spider. Now, this is obviously really hard, and we fuck this up all the time. I mean, this piece of advice is like almost kind of pointless because we all know to do it. So, one of three things happens. When you try to act despite it. First thing that can happen is that you pussy out. Now we've all bitched out a lot. And when you bitch out, if you find yourself pussying out a lot, everybody read this? It says, break it down, right? Break it down. So I'll use a protein since it's an easy example and a lot of people relate to it. Um, if you're consistently bitching out of protein, and you consistently don't do it, the strategy you can use is break down the action into smaller chunks. So instead of going out and saying, I have to approach tonight, simply go out and say, okay, I'm going to ask three people what time it is. Or I'm going to ask three people for directions to some restaurant that I already know where it is. This at least gets you going through the motions and going through part of the behavior. Then once that doesn't scare you that much anymore, then you can move up and you can say, okay, now I'm going to ask three hot girls for directions. And you can push through that. And then once you've done that, then you can actually approach them and hit on them. Does that make sense for everybody? That's an important thing. Cool. Uh, second thing that can happen is you do it. You do it, and it's really awkward. Everybody knows that anxiety makes you do awkward things. Awkward conversations, stand there nervously, doing weird things with your fingers. If you do it and it's awkward, and by awkward I mean it's so awkward that it's like causing problems, the way you deal with this is you just simply acknowledge the awkwardness. You simply say, look I'm really nervous right now, but I think you're really cute. Um, if you're in bed and you're freaking out, you actually say, look, it's been a while since I've done this. I'm a little bit nervous. We should go slow. Now, I know this goes against the whole, like, you got to be the fucking man, and you got to fuck her eight ways from Tuesday. You look bust all over her face. Oh. <laughs> That's not what <coughs> sex is like most of the time, especially if you have sexual anxiety. The way you get over sexual anxiety is you acknowledge it, and you realize it's not a big deal. Every guy deals with some sort of sexual anxiety at some point. And you know what? Every girl has dealt with a guy who had sexual anxiety at one point. Girls don't give a shit. They're like, thank God he finally admitted it. Thank God a guy admitted it. Girls are sick of guys trying to hide their insecurities. They don't care. It's not a big deal. Hell, sometimes they find it endearing. They're like, oh, sweet. I can take my time and enjoy it. It takes pressure off them, too. There's a lot of pressure on people in our culture to be these sex machines. You know, we see it in movies, we see it in porno. The truth is, is that sex is a little bit awkward. Set people are a little bit insecure. Sex is also usually a little bit emotional. That's normal. So don't try to deny it. So yeah. If it gets a little bit awkward, just say, hey, a little bit awkward right now, but that's okay. If you accept it, she'll accept it. And then finally, the third way that it can end up to a bang. Everything's good. <laughs> and the thing is, is if you do these things enough, eventually everything will be good. 
accustomed to acknowledging what makes you anxious or what makes you feel weird, eventually it will stop making you feel weird. There are parts of my identity that back in 2007, 2006, I was scared to death to tell a girl about. But after I did it enough times and realized that it wasn't a big deal, now it doesn't bother me anymore. So there were things like seven years ago that I was very nervous about sharing with the girl. But I did. And after time, it's not a problem anymore. Eventually, everything turns out okay. But this is the only way to deal with it. This is the only way to deal with the real problem. Oh, hello. A <laughs> single. It's actually my ex girlfriend. <laughs> you could really fuck with her. That's the only calls for the time today, right? <laughs> Most of the times, uh, like 
soluble through the air and act into our absolutely astounding. Yeah, okay.
intuitually and then also emotionally. So, um, if you're nerdy and out of shape and like anime, you're going to naturally attract girls who are nerdy, out of shape, and into anime. Um, which is fine, except if you want like, you know, some like swimsuit model. And the idea behind demographics is that instead of trying to convince women who aren't normally interested in you to be interested in you, instead of performing, the idea is to change to become the type of man that you want to be. So, um, this also has a lot of effect on where you are, where you're meeting women. Um, there are a lot of guys who are in the pickup who are very intellectual, they don't drink, they don't dance, they don't like electronic music, yet they go to nightclubs every week. And they don't have any success. And it's like, well, of course, because <laughs> you don't like anything about being there except for the girls. And um, it's just, it's going to come out in your attitude, it's going to come out in how you feel, um, and it's going to make you a lot needier and a lot more desperate. So go where where you like to be. You know, if you're really into tennis, like join a tennis group. If you like, um, you know, if you're like, if you're really into film, like join some sort of independent film crew. Um, Start, start meeting women in the places that you're interested in because it's going to eliminate a lot of the gap and a lot of the feeling that you need to perform to impress them or something like that. Uh, on an emotional level, demographics works in that um, if you're very needy, then you will attract women who are very needy. Uh, if you're very manipulative, you'll attract women that are very manipulative. Does that make sense? Um, there's a, um, like this concept that probably confuses everybody around yeah. uh, in the pickup community. That is, sorry, the shit test. And I know that you have like um, a different approach on that. Yeah, I don't really believe in shit tests. Um, I, I think men get a little paranoid. I think it comes back to uh, shit. What is it? <laughs> um, Looking for the pen? Yeah, it comes back to the anger blame thing. Um, the whole idea of a shit test is that a woman is trying to see if you're congruent with who you're portraying. Um, if you're not performing anything, then she's not. There's nothing to shit test. You know, like if you're not trying to brag about something, she's not going to test you about it. And if you are being real and honest. And she does question it, you're going to have no problem being like, no, actually that's how I am. Um, I, I think shit testing is just basically it's general skepticism of strangers. Uh, you know, it's like if you met a guy on the side of the road and he started telling you about how he's in a rock band, you'd probably be like, what band? Really? Like, where have you been? Um, so it's just honest skepticism. And I don't see it as a big problem. Uh, and if I do feel like a, a girl is like intentionally trying to fuck with me or kind of piss me off, uh, I reject it. So, no problem. Okay, I have a question. Uh, you mainly do direct game. You are honest with the girls and vulnerable. Do you ever nowadays use indirect game or uh, something that you would put aside? I don't, I don't think of it anymore in terms of game. I just talk. And I try to express myself as honestly as possible. And sometimes that means that I'm very upfront. Like, I'm like, you're very beautiful. I want to meet you. Sometimes that means I don't say that for a while. But um, I... If I'm feeling attracted, or if I'm very interested in her, I, I'm always willing to say it, and I always do say it. So, I guess you could call it direct game, but I guess if indirect game is hiding how you feel, then yeah, I don't ever do it directly. But in 
terms of opening also? You are also uh, always open and no. going for the... I open whatever I feel like. Uh, sometimes I say stupid things, but... You know, like whatever I feel in the moment, really. For example, if you were to see a set list of the women, yeah. how do you approach? Hi, how are you guys doing tonight? My name is Mark. Oh my god, what are you doing, my man? Go, bro, 
culture, a marriage, um, women look only to their kind of things. Yeah, I'm sorry, my friend. I'm just here to share now to, to connect with other good people. But if the rest of the world were there, I would also talk with the husband to say, go, 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 go. And uh, they are just uh, leave the, the place. So my, my question is the following. If you approach very sincere, sincere, you have uh, some probably that sometimes the husband can talk with you. <laughs> no, I have this scar, this scar because of that. Yeah. I, I approach a girl and the, the guy went and give me um, a glass here right. just because of being really straight. Right. Well, it, it's. Yeah, I know. She was, I, not, she was not big, but the stone of the no. hand. No, I, the I, guy. I've gotten beat up before. Um, yeah. 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 It's not common, but a lot of it has to do with, this is what I found with boyfriends and husbands, and just other guys in general. For them, it's all about respect. So, if they feel like you're being disrespectful or disregarding them somehow, um, then they get upset. Really upset. Um, but in my experience, most most guys, at the worst, they'll kind of come over and they'll be like, that's my girlfriend, fuck off. It's like, okay, bye. Um, but it's when, when I've had problems and when the time that I got, I didn't get beat up, but like I got punched in the face. Um, the time I got punched, I was being very flirty, grabbing the girl, and her boyfriend was actually just like 10 feet away watching. And so he felt like I was dis being disrespectful to her. Uh, I was being too aggressive. And um, so he just came over and punched me. But, <laughs> I mean, like I said, it, it, for me it's about being open and direct, but it's also being respectful of the other person's thoughts and feelings and stuff like that. So. Um, there are crazy people out there. There are crazy guys who are very jealous, but such is life. The other thing I was going to say is um, the just the act of being so direct and just coming out and saying, like, like. I wasn't going to come out tonight, but I'm glad I did because you're really awesome and I like hanging out with you. Just being able to say things like that or just saying like, um, yeah, you should come home with me because you're beautiful and we'd have fun in bed. Um, even when they say no or even when they reject you, it creates attraction and respect. Yeah, tons of respect. And how how it creates attraction? Because you're being bold. You're showing. You're, you're showing that. If it creates uh, yeah, attraction, why? The girl win. Huh? If it creates respect, why the girl win? Because attraction is not enough. I mean, I'm attracted to girls every day, but I don't go fuck with my girlfriend. Or I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> I have shit to do. <laughs> sex yet. Or I'm leaving town in three days and I'm a nice guy, but yeah, but they used to have all the time. All the time. Yeah, that's it. Too much well, so another explanation, you get one point for that, but to, in order to get a kiss, you need to like three or five months. So it's, you have to accumulate more attraction. Yeah, but I, I still think, I mean, I guess where I disagree is with kind of pick up theory in general, it's attraction is not enough. Attraction is just one part of it. I mean, I, I don't want to have sex with every girl I'm attracted to. That'd be tiring. I'm getting nothing done. Send that. Send that to us. People have lives. <laughs> about that thing that uh, connect with uh, many relationships at the same time.
I, right. Poly, yeah. Uh, yeah. I sit in uh, some way that I'm right now searching a little bit because at the same time we are young, so when you grow up, maybe you yeah. change your idea. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> I definitely agree. I mean, there, there's scientific evidence that people are capable of being sexually attracted to multiple people and being in love with multiple people at the same time. Uh, I, I, a lot of people take that to mean that we have to be polyamorous or that we're naturally polyamorous. Uh, I, I don't see that. I think a lot of people are very happy being monogamous. I think some people are very happy being polyamorous. I think it just it changes based on the person and on the need. Um, I went through a phase, actually my, my relationship with my ex-girlfriend, the one who was called, um, was polyamorous. And at the time I thought it was awesome, but um, looking back three years later, there were some issues and problems that we were just kind of ignoring and having sex with other people to, uh, or I was having sex with other people to avoid dealing with them. But, uh, so yeah, I, I think it's, it's not wrong, but it's, it's just another choice. It's another life choice. Yeah, because for me, for me, sweetie, it's another thing when you can have a relation yeah. and you meet someone and you have one night stand there. Yeah, I, I think for men in particular, I think men really need to go through a phase where they feel like they have a lot of sexual choices. And I think it's important for a lot of men <coughs> to do that before they feel comfortable having serious relationships or committed relationships. So, um, but then there are people who, who don't need, don't feel a need to do that. So. Uh, I, I, you know, you see a lot of stuff in the pickup community saying that guys are average frustrated chumps and that men are supposed to be promiscuous um, and not monogamous. And I, I don't buy that. I think people are different. I think people, um, people have different sex drives. People have different desires for partners. Um, people have different desires for relationships. So, and people change as time goes on. So I think it's it's a personal choice. And I think if somebody wants to be polyamorous, that's okay. But if they don't, that's okay too. It's also because of, even you see the statistics that uh, in Western uh, countries that there is a lot of uh, betrayed and uh, outside of marriage and all that stuff, and you, you hear it a lot of times. Yeah. So I think it also influences you to be even thinking, oh, why the hell I'm gonna marry a girl and uh, yeah. living all the time with her? Uh, yeah, it, it's that took people think. I mean, the I think the one thing that is definitely true and that we finally kind of discovered is that the idea of lifelong marriage with one person and never being with anybody else, uh, it's a minority of people, and uh, so. I don't think, again, there are a lot of people who make a lot of judgments about that. They say that we should be polyamorous, or that we should do this, or we should do that, um, or that society is fucked. Um, I don't really believe any of those things. I just think that we're becoming more aware of our, of our needs, and that I think it's just more important going forward. Um, you know, even though there are, the divorce rate is high now, um, it, people are more satisfied in their marriages today than they so I think knowing these things and being able to talk about them and deal with them, um, it's making things more complicated, but the people who do get married end up being happier and more stable because of it. Yeah. Um, when you see a girl that you are attracted to, you, you go straight to her or you flirt with her from the distance a little bit before the, you go talking. Um, I usually just go talk to her. That's right. Yeah. yeah. You, what I've found with myself is the less I think about it, the better it goes. When, when, when it comes to approaching. The less I think about, well, she looked at me, should I look back? All this stuff. Uh, usually, the sooner I go, the better it goes. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, the process of overcoming anxiety. <coughs> Yeah, like I mean, in the paper it looks beautiful, the scheme and everything. Right. Um, like, do you set goals for yourself? Like, do you force yourself to do this or? Yes. Like, how how did you do 
develop to overcome it, you know, like. So I think it's it's useful to set goals. I think you have to be careful though, because if you set too many if you quantify your anxiety too much, it just makes it worse. So um, yeah, I did set goals, but for me it was more um, it was more about it, it was pretty loosely based. Like I had a period for a few months where it was just go out five nights a week and just approach as much as I possibly can. And if I went out and I only approached once one night, I didn't get really upset about it. Um, you know, and then I'd go out and approach like seven or eight times the next night and I'd feel good about it. But I, I never tried to measure it too much. Um, because I, I think, and I've found in other guys, that if you're measuring it too much, um, it can just create more anxiety. Because then you go out, like you, you know, let's say I go out and I decide I'm going to approach 10 girls, and I go out and I approach 8, and even though I feel great about approaching 8 girls, I'm like, I'm putting pressure on myself, I'm still feeling bad because I didn't approach 10. And so that can actually increase anxiety in the long run. What is, for example, let's say you set a goal for yourself, and you go to the club and you push you out, yeah? And you say, like, the, you should break it down. Right. So, like, you just go home and say, oh, I was, you know, giving excuses to myself or something. And so you acknowledge the, the fact that you pussy that. And what Absolutely. You and, but I don't judge myself for it. That's and like you just, just say, like, next time I will do it. Or exactly. Yeah. Okay. It's like, you know what? I bitched out again. But that's okay. Everybody bitches out sometimes. And I'll just do better tomorrow. You know, it's always competing with yourself. Nobody else. wrote um, that um, game is a uh, pretty emotional process rather than like, um, cool. uh, like a value game or so. Yeah. Um, can you talk about that a bit? What, you, what exactly you want to do? That? Right. So, um, this is the funny thing. A lot of pickup theory says, you know, uh, women make their decisions based on emotion. Women decide if they like you or if they're going to sleep with you. It's an emotional decision for her. Um, what that they neglect is that it's also an emotional process, an emotional decision for us. Uh, so this is kind of what I was saying earlier about what you actually say or do can be attractive or unattractive. It really just comes down to why you're doing it and your self-perception while you're doing it. Because ultimately, a behavior or a line or a joke is only as successful as the emotions it creates in a girl. And there's no line that every girl has the same response to, emotional response to. There's no joke that every girl has the same emotional response to. There's no behavior that every girl has the same emotional response to. It's dependent on the context and it's dependent on uh, the motivations behind the behavior. So, uh, so yeah, it's attraction itself is uh, it's not a logical metric. It's not a logical decision. You you, you never sit there and say, uh, you know, it, like emotional connection is never a logical thing either. Your comfort with somebody. Uh, is not a logical, like it's not quantified. Uh, you just know, yes or no. Like every guy knows, like you, you look down the street and you just go like, yes or no, would you fuck her? Like every guy, like, yes, yes, no, no, yes. Like we don't sit there, and, you know, we like to sit there and be like, oh, she's a 7.3 or whatever. But um, ultimately it's a yes or no decision. and and. When you're talking to her, the way she makes you feel affects that. Um, if she's fun to be around and she makes you feel good about yourself, it affects that. It affects the yes or no answer. If um, you know, if you're drunk, it affects the yes or no answer. So it, it's it's an unconscious, illogical decision at all times. And 
the sooner you can you get away from trying to manip manipulate the logical perceptions, the rational perceptions of each other, and you start focusing on the irrational perceptions of each other, the better off you're going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Like the three, the three main myths from the pickup community. What will be your three main myths? <laughs> Also, the three main beliefs that uh, helped you most on your big up career. Wow. Uh, well, two big questions. Three myths. First one is you don't have to prove anything. You don't have to fucking. You don't need permission. You don't have to perform. I know I keep saying that, but like I just want to like, hit people in the head. Uh, it's really hard to get that through your head. Uh, that's myth number one. <laughs> myth number two is that uh, myth number two is that that having a lot of sex solves any problems really <laughs> with anything. Um, sure, it makes you have like it's more fun to have a lot of sex and it's more fun <laughs> to fuck a lot of girls, but. It doesn't make you necessarily happier. It doesn't make you more popular. It doesn't make you more friends. People don't treat you with more respect. You don't even. It, you don't even. It doesn't even create self-respect necessarily. Uh, it's just a fun thing. You said you want to have a lot of sex. What's that? You said you want to have a lot of sex. A lot of sex with a lot of girls. Okay, of course, because we have a lot of sex. It's good. It's good for you. No, sex is great. I'm not saying sex is bad. Sex is great. I'm just saying that. Of course, of course. Yeah, the pickup community says that it solves all these life problems, and it doesn't. It doesn't solve life problems. Um, it's like it's a band aid, basically. Uh, third myth. Portuguese. Uh, <laughs> more questions. No, 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 no. 